Madison. I'd like to welcome you to one of our final days of work here. I am pleased to be introducing Justin, architect, awarding architect and president of the Cosanti Foundation. Located in Central Arizona, the Urban Laboratory Art Cosanti is an ongoing experiment pioneering a new approach to the design of cities. Arcosanti was founded over 40 years ago by the legendary architect Paolo Solieri. Um, it is now in its being, sorry. It is now under the care of the Consanti Foundation. Jeff's work at Arcosanti is to integrate architecture and ecology and demonstrate an alternative human habitat. Jeff has served as the dean of the Boston Architectural College and has taught at architecture schools in the US, Switzerland, and France. Jeff also writes architectural Boston Magazine and has been an architecture critic for the New England newspapers Banker and Tradesman. So everyone, thank you and welcome Jeff. Thank you. And thank you all, not only for coming this afternoon, but putting on this whole conference. This HOPES conference is um, a really important part of world culture and not just this week. And I'm really glad to be here, the latest in a long line of people coming to Oregon and Eugene from Arco Santi, which includes Michael McConnell sitting right here from Portland, Oregon, um, who has also spent some time in Arco Santi, and, um, and first-year architecture student Hallie Anderson, who is out here as well. And also... Banks Upshaw, who for many years was the chief architect at Cosanti and who also was the campus architect here at the University of Oregon in Eugene. Oregon and Arcosanti, like that. <laughs> here is a picture of Paolo Soleri, the founder of Arcosanti really extraordinary architect from Italy and uh, who studied with Frank Lloyd Wright for a couple of years and who died just one year ago. And this was his question, and it is the question that Arcosanti raises and does not quite answer yet, as none of us have been able to answer it quite this week, but it is the question that we ask, and it's the question you're going to have to ask during your lives and professional careers too. How shall we live on the earth? It's still a question. Now, clearly, here's one answer. We're going to be living in cities. Over half of us on the planet now live in cities as it um, goes, and here are some statistics. Since 1970, and we saw a little bit of this in Shenzhen in the previous presentation, too. China has urbanized. Its urbanized growth has been 281% over those years. India, Brazil, the USA is uh, just about on this chart as well. Here's the problem. And it isn't really a problem of numbers of humans quite. And it isn't a problem of the numbers of us that want to live in cities. It's the pattern in which we have been making cities. This is pretty typical of not only American cities, but cities in India, Middle East, China, spreading a thin film of life across a great expanse that takes quite a bit of excess land, energy, time, materials to support it all. Here's a famous NASA photograph of Beijing, which, you know, is quite a bit larger than Portland, but really Portland and Eugene don't look this much different at night. And here we are, Phoenix and Waji, China, just because we don't have really good ideas about how to design cities yet in the United States doesn't mean that we aren't exporting these ideas all around the globe. We are still thought leaders in the realm of urban design in the U.S., and that's getting to be a big problem for the rest of the world. 
who'd like to be like us. And um, as we do, 5% of the world's population consuming a little more than 20% of the Earth's resources. It means that in this era of globalization that we're ensconced in right at this very minute, if everyone in the world were going to live the way we do, those of us in this room, it'd take four more Earths to support us all. I've done the math. We don't have four more Earths. This is a really interesting issue. So here's one of the pieces of research that we have come up with at Cosonic. In any given system, the most complex entity is also the most miniaturized. There's a way that technology has taken advantage of that, and so these things in your pocket, only a generation ago, the computing power invested in one of these would have taken up most of this room. But it doesn't anymore. Complexity, miniaturization. We're looking at biology when we talk about this stuff, though, and we're looking at the biology of evolution and, in fact, what we think of as being sort of the peak of evolution, the human brain. Each one of our brain cells connects directly, synapses with another 15,000 brain cells packed tightly, compactly, allowing for some complexity on all sides so that because of this design, it's a really great design, we are now the uh, going thing. We're the dominant species on the planet. This might be a good thing, maybe not, but it's only happened because of this design. Here's another example of that same thing, in a way, at a little bit different scale. I've done some work uh, in the last year with physicists at um, the Santa Fe Institute and they are working on the problem of cities as they see it. And the understanding which goes along with the work of Paolo Soleri and the Cosani Foundation that cities are the latest organism to inhabit the planet. Cities are organic. They are organisms. And uh, so when you look at other organisms, you see, first of all, that they're contained and they're three-dimensional and in their design, there are certain efficiencies. The Santa Fe Institute, for instance, has found that an elephant is 10,000 times bigger than a mouse. And yet, the elephant only uses 1,000 times the amount of energy that a mouse does because it is not 10,000 separate mice, but it's a single elegantly designed organism. That's what we have in mind for cities. In order for them to be sustainable, to sustain us, it's not good anymore to imagine that they can be 10,000 separate buildings, but rather they ought to be cities, single elegantly designed organisms. And we have a word for that, arcology, architecture and ecology as two parts of a whole system not separate entities, two parts of a single system. Here's some early research on the part of Soleri and uh, some of the people who were working with him at the time, left over from the mid-1950s. Here's a uh, drawing of a building. This is a sectional drawing of a building. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there are some horizontal lines. Those are floors for inhabitation. The whole building looks like a dish so that it can have um, places to collect solar energy. It also collects water. It might even be able to move to follow the sun or rainstorms. It's also meant, there's this little H2O thing here in the middle of the base of it. It's meant to be sited near an ocean so that incoming tides run 
electrical generators, turbines, as the, uh, as the water comes in. And as the water goes back out, it runs the turbines again. And so here's a building that is possible to produce its own electricity and to have a relation with its surroundings that is a little more interesting than most of the buildings we have going on now. Paolo Soleri graduated from the Torino Polytechnico in Turin, Italy with a doctorate of architecture, which was then and still is the standard professional degree in European architecture schools. And he had in mind to study a little bit at MIT after that and used this drawing and a series of others like it to point out the cosmic potential of architecture. And uh, he had in mind to uh, undertake a PhD study at MIT. And MIT turned him down. They later published his first two books. But at this point, they said, gee, you know, Gasoline is 10 cents a gallon, and um, oil is a dollar a barrel, and who cares about this stuff? Nobody. So see you later. That was then. This is now. Here are some other drawings of ways that buildings, entire towns, in fact, could be shaped to shade themselves in summertime from direct sun above our heads to uh, facing south, gain plenty of light and heat um, in the wintertime as you need it the most. Over a series of projects and several years' time, mostly in the 1960s and 70s, Soleri and the people working with him mined the notion of arcology, three-dimensional contained cities, and um, developed a series of different projects that um, might question um, the geometry of cities and also their density. But overall, three-dimensionality didn't mean tightly packed like hotels or high schools, but really three-dimensional with um, plenty of space inside the city. And yet the notion here is that a city designed like the rest of organic life on Earth, three-dimensional, compact, complex, would give its inhabitants the sort of connection to each other and their surroundings that we all really like, would give us the kind of urban intensity that more and more people are seeking and also allow us to be country people at the same time, be surrounded by the patterns of nature that 10,000 generations of humans have co-evolved with. And now more and more of us are um, missing. Along the way of the evolution of this idea came this notion, two suns arcology. One, the sun in the sky, 96 million miles away, just about the right distance, actually to be responsible for all of life on Earth and otherwise the evolving consciousness of humankind. Those two suns could develop something really interesting. And these are some examples, more sections of an arcology that um, could be an entire town that could shade itself, gather light and heat in the winter. And there on the left-hand side of the screen, this place is designed to be built on top of a hill facing south, and so hmm, solar greenhouses that could recycle organic wastes for soil, produce food for the consumption and powering its citizens, and produce heat energy to power the town itself. Food production right on the doorstep of your own town. Pretty interesting idea. And um, it happens almost nowhere in America right now. These are a series of models that take advantage of that notion. And other notions like it. 
there's a sort of a frugality overlaid with this idea of arcology. And here's one example of it. The Glen Canyon Dam, which exists now on the Colorado River above the Grand Canyon. And um, here's an example of what you could do to that dam by sighting a town of 12,000 people on the face of it. Water available for drinking, for recreation, for fish, for food, for irrigating cropland and um, greenhouses, as well as for generating electricity. Or in this case, an arcology in a very cold climate near Cheetah, Siberia, a mining town of about 20,000 people with a huge solar greenhouse. There are more examples of this, more questioning of the size and shape that these three-dimensional cities might be able to develop into. And um, from time to time, we have clients, although we've never built one yet. And um, here's an idea for how to stretch an arcology. In um, China, lean linear city, we were contacted by um, Beijing to design a town for about 250,000 people 50 kilometers west of Beijing. And uh, it's at the end of a railway line. Our idea was, gee, instead of um, putting it at the end of an hour-long commute, maybe the city could be linear and, um, and grow out from Beijing. Here's a section of how it could actually work. It's in a wind corridor. It goes east to west and uh, so is perfect for solar energy. And um, this was developed. A series of models were built by a group of Chinese architects and architecture students. And this resulted in a month-long exhibition in Beijing and um, a series of conferences and lectures and uh, two books. and. Um, and nothing more. Among the criticisms were too much democracy. <laughs> People would be able to um, meet and greet each other and get together in ways that central governments might not like that well. And the other issue was that China is becoming um, a car manufacturer. It's pretty much the greatest car manufacturer on the planet right now. Only a generation ago, it was bicycles and, according to us Americans, really romantic, um, dense cities. And now the Chinese are driving 120 million cars, and they expect to go up to 250 million within the next 10 years. Oh, boy. Well, this all started with the Cosanti Foundation, um, a made-up word by Paolo Soleri. Cosa and Anti, two Italian words meaning literally before things. Cosanti Foundation is a place for ideas before things. It's sort of the antithesis of um, the Nike slogan, just do it. We'd rather just think about it imagine how it's going to affect several generations out and, um, and what the externalities in our current economy would have to be in order for things to go on and then maybe do it. It also has to do with architecture in the Frank Lloyd Wright mode. His idea was, of course, that architecture is the mother of all the arts. You want to do something like have uh, dance, you need a dance studio or symphony, a symphony hall or a little get-together like this, you need an auditorium. Architecture comes before anything. And being an architect seems only natural, right? So here are some of the early buildings at um, the Cosanti Foundation in Paradise Valley, Arizona. Experiments really about how to live 
in the Sonoran Desert. Here's a, a photograph of Paulo Soleri around 1961 hosing off the desert floor. This actually is the floor of the desert at Kosanti, and it's been carved into. This is dirt that has been carved into, wetted, made into this form, and there are these grooves where some steel reinforcement is going to be placed, and then concrete is going to be poured right over the top of this thing. And then what's underneath gets dug out, and that becomes the roof of a building. And the roof then gets um, earth bermed on top of it, and it's an earth-sheltered studio at Kosanti, and it's still there now, 50 years later, and, uh, and you could visit it, too. Another idea for how buildings might work in the Arizona desert is two roofs. The Corbusier did this in um, Zurich, Switzerland, too, in a really wonderful little building. But um, in Phoenix, Arizona, two roofs really make sense. You can, um, it's like, it's garments. You know, if I were too hot here right now, I would just take this jacket off and, um, and maybe um, my shirt too, because I have a, um, a Hopes 20 t-shirt. It'd still be okay. But we don't do that with buildings at all. And so um, here we are putting on some garments to protect ourselves from the sun in the summertime. We take those things off in the winter and the sunlight hits the building itself and warms things up. Another example of some of the concrete architecture at a certain small scale, really. It's pretty intimate at Kosanti. This is a ceramic studio next to an office. We're looking at the wall of that office, and here's what's on the inside of that little building. On the left is north. That's a, sort of a half-shell structure, concrete structure that is earth-bermed. And then on the south, it's a canvas lid. So in the wintertime, the sun shines through there, warms things up. In the summertime, there are bamboo shades that go over the canvas, and so things stay pretty cool. And right along the top, where there's a fluorescent tube, above that, um, in, initially, in the concrete was this little tube that sprayed water onto the, con onto the canvas so that the canvas would cool itself and that water vapor would find its way in, and it's kind of an evaporative cooling solution to that place. Here's another ornamental structure almost. It's a canopy over the shallow end of the swimming pool at Kosanti. This was constructed before the swimming pool was there. These 12 telephone poles, three in each corner, were placed into the ground on great footings, and then a low mound of dirt was piled up, packed down, as we saw before, carved into a little bit for design and structural reasons, and then concrete was poured on top of it, was allowed to cure for whatever that is, 28 days. And then a crane came in and lifted it up to the top of these poles where it sits, 20 tons of concrete over everybody's head. It's a big heat sink so that in the summertime, that overhead sun is shining down on here the shade that results keeps that shallow end of the pool fairly cool, so it's comfortable to be out there during the day. But in the evening time, there's not much water vapor in the desert air here, and so the air gets cool at night, and this big concrete structure loses its heat, much of it wasted up into the sky, but other bits of it is radiated down, and so you can be out on the pool in a really comfortable lovable situation um, day and night year-round because, of course, in the wintertime when the sun's down by the southern horizon coming this way, it shines all the way in there and warms everything up. Another piece of architectural activity at Kosanti Foundation, this case, there was a tree there already. doesn't mean you have to cut the tree down. It means you can build around it. And in this case, it's a deciduous tree, and so in the summertime, it shades the building that has been built around it. 
and in the winter time it drops its leaves and the sun shines right through. Things change at Argosanti, begun in 1970 as a kind of an urban laboratory. That's a term that the architecture critic Ada Louise Huxtable gave to the place. Solari is building out in Arizona, 70 miles north of Phoenix, a kind of urban laboratory. And we all thought, yeah, that's what this is. <laughs> it is an urban laboratory to test some things. Architecture, part of that, but the socialization, the connection that comes from a certain kind of architecture really is the test. This is Arcosanti in its um, village condition, which is um, about right now. A series of prototype buildings that are meant to connect people to each other, to their work, to the landscape itself, and to the rest of the world, which they do pretty interestingly. They also have been built using some sort of third world techniques and also built by a cadre of volunteers, people who actually pay a tuition to come to construction workshops. This has been the um, thread that has connected 1970 to 2014. There are still construction workshops at Arcosanti now, five-week workshops, and um, people from all over the world continue to come to that place to participate in its construction and learn about what has gone forward. Built mostly of concrete for a whole bunch of interesting reasons, among which is that Absolute amateurs can work with concrete in um, really positive and powerful ways. And if we were to go with that sort of cultural scam that is lead, L-E-E-D, we would be lead gold for sure because the concrete is coming from a concrete uh, cement plant mined um, only about 20 miles away. The sand comes from the site itself, and the formwork, of course, is earth from the site. You know, in building concrete buildings, most of the time, about 50% of the cost of the building is the formwork itself, which until only lately never got reused. Now it's made out of stainless steel oftentimes, and, um, and it does get reused, but it means the formwork is even more expensive than it used to be. So here's concrete formwork that is silt. It's earth from the site itself, and it is piled up, packed down, carved into. Concrete is placed directly on it. Here's a picture of 85-year-old Paolo Soleri troweling some concrete into uh, some architecture there. Concrete pigment can be placed on the wooden, the earthen formwork, and uh, as a result, coloration can happen. And you get things like this. This is a huge vaulted arch. There are a couple of them right at the very center of Arcosanti. And these were the things that were constructed first. The first stuff to be built at Arcosanti was public space not classrooms or apartments or um, businesses or stores or shops, but the covering of public space. Here's how it was built, some of the stuff um, cast in place and then the rest of the panels cast on the desert floor and lifted into place with a crane. And here's how Arcosanti started. It's not like uh, building a new subdivision at the edge of Eugene where you can hook into the water supply and the sewer lines and, um, and hook up that um, electrical situation and some gas pipes. This is out in central Arizona, a couple miles off Interstate 17 on the top of a mesa. We're not the first persons to inhabit this place. There are petroglyphs and, um, and Pueblo ruins on the landscape itself. Kosani Foundation owns 860 acres there and leases another 3,200. So we have a 4,000 acre land preserve 
on which we are building um, only on 15 acres on the top of this particular mesa, but here was the beginning of it, the start of some public space that ends up looking like this when it's empty and, um, and this when things are happening in it. There's a terrific series of performing arts events that go on at Arcosanti all year round, and this is a group, a pyrotechnic theater troupe called Flam Chen from Tucson, some of them used to be part of Cirque du Soleil, but Cirque du Soleil wasn't dangerous enough for them, apparently, and so they broke off, and now they live in Tucson and perform at Arcosanti every so often. Or here, Dinner for 200 under the vaulted arches, which not only shade the place from some sun, but they direct views to the surrounding landscape, too. And here's a balcony on uh, part of an apartment building that's next to, to this vault, and the balcony is also a roof scupper. We um, harvest rainwater, because there's not very much of it, in, until the drought started. We're in the midst of a 30-year drought in Arizona and the American Southwest generally. We're in the 12th year of it. Before then, we were getting about 15 inches of rain a year at Arcosanti. It falls on the building tops and, um, and into this sort of a scupper. There are several of these around, and um, it, they drain into cisterns, and we use that water for landscape watering. You know, there are ways that architecture relates to, like humans, to the ground. There's this base, there's a great middle, and there's a top that relates to the sky. And so on some of these buildings, there are some ornaments that draw your eye up so that you do relate to the sky. In this case, we've been looking at the top of a ceramic studio. Here's an interesting um, thing about Paolo Soleri and a way that he might be a model for you once you graduate into a really crummy um, economy in this country. And that is, just because you're educated as an architect doesn't mean you have to earn your living as one. It means you're um, thoughtful and, um, and trained to think things through in a three-dimensional way. You know how to make things, and buildings <clears throat> aren't the only things you know how to make. Among Paolo Soleri's first commissions as an architect in Italy was a terrific ceramics factory. And it still exists in Vietri um, in southern Italy, and it's still a ceramic factory. And in making that building, he learned the ceramics trade as well, the craft of it. And so in Arizona, some of his first work was remembering that craft and how to make ceramic instruments, tools. This is a, um, a tray of dirt, earth, and it has been carved into to make molds for ceramic wind bells. It's earth, you dig a hole in it, and uh, you pour that full of slip, which is a ceramic material about the consistency of pancake batter. It begins to dry from the outside first, and when it gets thick enough, you can dip the rest of it out and let this stuff um, dry, and the result is this. And of course, the clay also comes from Arizona, from Globe, Arizona, not too far away from us. And uh, so we're making art objects out of dirt, and uh, of course, Unless you drop them on the concrete floor, they last forever, too. So wind bells, an interesting way to support the beginnings of a career in architectural research. So Soleri took that idea, the technology of making these ceramic bells, and translated it into making buildings. But instead of digging a hole for the building, you pile the earth up, carve into it, you might place precast uh, concrete elements in it, and uh, eventually pour concrete on it. Looks like that from the back and this from the front. 
a ceramic studio in the shape of an apse, a quarter of a sphere that, again, shades itself in the summertime, gathers light and heat from the low winter sun. You probably know by now from going to architecture school that if you have a design solution, it can't solve just one problem. You have to solve at least two or three problems or it's just not worth having come up with that solution. And so this shape is good for energy on the one hand, but it's also really great for socialization. The people who are working in this apps, there are half a dozen of them making ceramic bells and tools on a daily basis, get to see each other, they get to hear each other, they get to be able to talk and see each other's work and um, the socialization involved with this is really great. It's a great place to work. There's also a uh, temporary stage that can happen that covers the central workspace and so the entire building after hours can become a performing arts little amphitheater for chamber music or lectures and Here's another thing. Lou Kahn, in the 1950s, 20th century American architect from Philadelphia, said, the urban street is uh, the city's living room. It's a place where a young boy, and it was the 50s, so it was always a young boy in the 50s, though now girls can do this too, can walk down the street and uh, find out what it is that he wants to do for the rest of his life. That was a really romantic notion that Lucan brought up, and it probably uh, worked in the Renaissance, but not since then, and certainly not any streets that um, you and I know of, which are filled with carbon monoxide and noisy, dangerous cars. You don't want your young boy near that stuff. But at Argosanti, which is a walkable town at this point, and is meant to continue to be that, People walk past this and they can see what's going on. It's open to the public. In fact, it really connects. It's an educational building because of the form that it has. And it turns out, really, that that's how architecture can connect people inside to outside. The way you connect through architecture is you just don't build the fourth wall. And in that particular climate, central Arizona, it's possible to get by with that kind of stuff too. There's a 30 degree temperature difference between being in the shade and in the sun at this place and so it's that much warmer in the wintertime than the ambient outside air, that much cooler in the summertime. Plus, if it gets too hot, you take off a few clothes. That's just how life is at Argosanti. Another version of this same apse shape, though this one with um, a little added complexity, is this bronze foundry. What we're looking at now is the inside of an apse. Down below are some very shallow studios that are part of the foundry. And above are windows that are looking into two-story apartments that surround the building on the north side especially so people can live and work in the same building. You know, the average American, the average American not just in Eugene or Portland or Bozeman, Montana, but all across the country, averagely we drive half an hour a day to our work or school and another half an hour back. You can worry about the XL pipeline as much as you want, but if your job is half an hour away, you're going to continue to be driving for quite some time to come. But there's a way that architecture can become a little more complex. People can live and work in the same place and produce things like this, bronze wind bells, famous Soleri bells that are sold in stores and shops around the US and in some other places and online. These are sold online. Well, here's the view from the foundry floor. If you ever thought you wanted to work in a bronze foundry, this is probably the one you want to work in. And another view of a part of it. And then there's this model. The next step at Arcosanti was to build, and this is the great thing about that place, we're making things, we're building buildings continuously. And this was um, meant to be the East Crescent, 
a crescent-shaped integral urban neighborhood that instead of packing houses right up against those old streets, carbon monoxide and car-filled and noisy streets, the houses and some institutional um, spaces are packed around the back wall of a performing arts amphitheater in which private space then begins to define the edge of public space. Here was the first bit of construction of that piece beginning of putting some seats in and uh, the back walls of some of the apartments. The seats have integral concrete pigment and there are chairs that sit on these things too. And ultimately, that's what it looks like. Apartments and also some dormitories and a library and some other spaces for our own students that are surrounding a performing arts center. So we've gone from just public space to an apps that works with energy and the, um, the public and work to an apps that has uh, living spaces around it to now an integral urban neighborhood where about 40 people live at this moment and has seating for 300. And so here are some other views of the construction of Arcosanti so far. This is a little bit of a photo of my apartment. I live in around 600 square feet at this place and yet have all kinds of outdoor space. I'm on the edge of this performing arts amphitheater and this solar greenhouse that you're looking at on the right hand side of your screen is my furnace. It's the heating source for my apartment and for much else of the East Crescent there as well. Also, it's the tomato source, of course. And so this is a model of what Arcosanti is intended to become over the next generation or so, a town for between three and 5,000 people. The dark gray pieces are what have been built so far, kind of a base camp for arcology in the central Arizona desert. We've built some things, we've learned from them, we continue to complexify and we go right on. And then the lighter colored stuff is the town structure itself, about 20 stories tall on the top of this mesa, down at the bottom of the slide, a series of large solar greenhouses that are meant to produce heat and food and recycle organic wastes as part of the ecology of the city itself. The whole city is shaped so that it shades itself in summer, gathers light and heat as it faces south in winter. There are some round pieces at Arcosanti, in part because even though plywood comes in four by eight rectangles, Almost nothing else out there in the natural world is rectangular. Everything's round. We're on a round planet in a round solar system in a universe that appears to be round too. And so as you look to the horizon through these uh, round openings, it sort of connects you subconsciously to your surroundings. Well, so, oh, and this is a view from my apartment with the very computer on which I was sorting these slides just the other day on the desk. 
Only lately, a film crew from Canadian television was at Arcosani. We get about 50,000 visitors a year at this place, and, um, and many of them are TV film crews, magazine journalists, online people who are looking for some solutions. Everybody's worried, and for good reason, too. And so there are people who think Arcosani might have something to offer, might have some relevance to answer that question, how shall we live? Because it's not just us or architects who are asking this question. So Canadian television is doing a series on uh, nature deficit disorder, which apparently is a real thing with young children who are, for the most part, living inside buildings with four walls and a floor and a roof and looking into computer screens for their early parts of their childhood. And as a result, have um, all sorts of really interesting um, little disabilities and personality quirks, not being a part of surrounding natural landscape patterns which we've all co-evolved with. And so this film crew imagined that Argosani might have something to say about that, and indeed it does. It's arcology, architecture and ecology, as Paolo Soleri began to imagine it a half century ago, and as it continues today, admits that we are part of the life of the earth, that our culture, built culture especially, can be coherent with nature, and like nature, like all life, our buildings, our cities, must be both miniaturized and complex. They have to do more than keep the rain out, more than garage a series of segregated activities and people. This was the idea in 1970 when this project was started, and it continues to draw people and attention to this place. Here's the idea. Let's make our buildings, our cities, grow food, generate energy. Let's design them to recycle waste. Let's make them in a way that allows us to be together face to face, not just back to back. Let's not make them dull. Let's make them support life. Let's make them extraordinary in the way they allow us to confront each other and the cosmos. And let's see what happens then. That's what I wanted to tell you. Yes, they are. How are you planning to address that, considering your technique construction is relying on unskilled volunteers? It's the great question that we have, and the thing that, in fact, Paul Solari's death is allowing us to do, frankly. Um, it always occurs when the charismatic leader of some place retires or dies that there's a little bit of scramble to figure out what exactly were the important parts of his idea and, and what he might have been standing in the way of and, um, and what things open up now that a new generation is taking over. You'll find this in all sorts of places that you yourselves experience too. And so for Soleri, it was for his lifetime his idea that he would actually take part in the craft of making these buildings. And in fact, one of the reasons why that East Crescent neighborhood is three stories tall instead of 12 stories tall is that um, he had limitations and, um, and they were at the three story level. Now, here's another interesting issue about um, Arco Santi and that is that it has bootstrapped itself so far. It hasn't taken advantage of any government grants because you may understand that the government is behind suburbanization since World War II and um, this stands in the way of it and it isn't sort of in the government or big oil's interest in conserving land and uh, energy and um, materials in the way that this project promises to do that. And um, anyway, so we haven't um, had 
grants from Warren Buffett, who, by the way, now owns a railroad that is taking um, coal from Wyoming to eastern seaports to ship to China. Because the coal has too much uh, carbon in it, it is too dirty to burn in America from Wyoming. But um, we can burn it in China. But when it does get burned in China, of course, the, those are the heavy metals that you can measure in Eugene when it rains because that stuff just keeps coming back. There is no away. You want to throw something away? There is no away. Everything is connected. Anyway, so we haven't had grants or um, outside investment in our Kosani either. And so now um, the board of the Kosani Foundation, along with a group of um, some alumni who have after doing workshops at Argosani, gone on to really interesting careers in urban planning around the country, have come together to do some strategic planning about Argosani, about what the next big thing is there and, um, and how it can be funded by investment and actual return on investment. So there gets to be a way that Argosani is about to become more relevant to some more people in that regard. So yes, it's a change in how things have happened so far, um, but we're still building on what has gone before and we hope not to change much the nature of that place. Yes. Thanks. Um, so I guess my question is a little bit related to that, but I was wondering, since Arcosani is so focused on experimentation, how you guys fail and do you fail sustainably? Because um, that pretty much comes along with experimentation is this idea of, of failing a lot until you get it right. So. Oh yeah, so if I understand it, the question is um, how are the, what are the good examples of how we have failed at Arcosanti and, um, and gone right on to um, continue? Right, failing sustainably, that's exactly what you would like to do. <laughs> and it's probably the best that you can do too since none of us have any real idea what the hell we're doing on this planet anyway. And, um, and so we're all, con it's all conjecture. There's not a future, there's something we can plan for and, um, and try to build and if the tsunami doesn't come and wipe it out that could be really good too but um, there's this other stuff and so Yes, yeah, so how have we um, failed sustainably? Um, one way is that we have started small and remained small and, and done some um, very small projects like we made a road into the site. There wasn't a road there in 1970 when things started um, to happen. And um, so that road was... Um, graded with a bulldozer and some gravel was put down on it and not a lot of investment has happened since then and um, so it's still this gravel road two and a half miles long it hasn't been paved it's not great for tour buses it's, it's fine if you have a rental car by the way but um, if you actually own your own car it's a little bumpy as well and that sort of thing um, um, prevents the faint of heart from actually visiting Arcosani. As I mentioned, we have about 50,000 visitors a year, which sounds pretty good actually, and people pay and they go on tours and buy bells and talk to us, and uh, it's a pretty interesting place as a result of that. The Grand Canyon that has um, paved roads has three million visitors a year, just up the road a little bit from us, and so we've failed to um, capture some of the public's imagination because they just can't get there on that road. On the other hand, um, we haven't put down a lot of oil on the ground. I mean, really, America uses about um, 20 million barrels of oil a year and has pretty regularly, for the last 20 years at least, um, to create asphalt for roads. Roads, streets, parking lots. This is great. In order to make wheel vehicles go really comfortably, you just put down oil on the ground and uh, there you go. It's smooth, it's lovely. 
and um, and nothing grows, and it off gases, and it's totally poisonous, and um, and yet we use it that way. So we haven't used it that way at Arcosanti, and and so there's a little bit of a barrier to tourism, and yet it's a sustainable barrier, and so. Um, We've been asked by the county to upgrade these days, and we are putting some more gravel on it and um, bringing it up to some standards, but we're not going to pave it right away. It'll be smoother, it'll be more workable, but um, still sustainable. It's that way about some other pieces of infrastructure at Arcosanti, too. Um, we have an oxidation pond, which is the sewage treatment plant for us, in which if you flush a toilet, or um, we have a little bit of gray water systems going on, but if water goes down the drain, it goes down to the end of a pipe and into a little pond that is um, filled with aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, and some of it um, sinks down and filters through ground to the um, aquifer below us, and, um, and the rest evaporates off. and. Um, it's great, but it isn't going to last much longer because we're at the sort of upper level of the number of people who can use it and in its location, too. So we're thinking far enough ahead for that kind of infrastructure. And uh, there are a few things like that that have happened. Also, here's a way to deal with sustainability, and it's the way we have done it at Arcosanti, too, which is... You build the sort of most interesting space. You enclose the most interesting space that you can, make the um, most interesting architecture possible, and then after you've started to live in it for a few years, you retrofit it for um, all sorts of things, which could be um, insulation and um, different um, materials, um, ways of um, getting rain off of it and uh, harvesting that, or um, ways that um, the sun can heat it there. Architecture, in the profession of architecture, it's pretty much a one-shot deal. You design the building, it gets built, you go on to the next thing. But if you're actually living in the building that you've designed, it's a kind of an evolution. There are all sorts of ways that the building can change to become even more sustainable than you thought about it in the first place. It's not just maintenance, but it really is transformation. Which, by the way, is what this place, Arcosanti, is about. There are people who imagine that Paulo Soleri is kind of the grandfather of the sustainability movement, but not really. It's not about sustainability, whatever that means. He's more about transformation. His idea isn't to sustain Phoenix, Arizona, the way it is, 900 square miles, 60% of which is covered with roads and cars and parking lots, automobile-related media, and in which 4.5 million people spend about 13 billion dollars a year on cars, according to the American Automobile Association. Can't live in Phoenix without a car, but 13 billion just to go to the grocery store or to school or to soccer practice. This is a little troubling. It's a huge transfer of wealth from almost every citizen to a few car companies. And this is, by the way, just cars, too. It, and insurance and maintenance on cars it's not buying gasoline, which is another 10 to $12 billion a year. And it's not building roads either, which, you know, are a million dollars a mile. So the notion of developing arcology, walking cities, three-dimensional pedestrian places, I mean, really, we're really built for that as humans. You know, the golden mean um, proportion, 1 to 1.6, it's legs versus trunk. We're really built to walk around in cities, and um, it turns out our tax structure would be a lot more interesting if we had more walkable cities, too, because, of course, right now, the whole defense posture of um, this country and many others is how to keep oil coming so that we can drive our cars around cities, which is where mostly we drive cars. Seventy percent of car trips are 30 miles or less, and they're within city limits, not going across country. 
if you're going across country, go ahead. But worse than that, interestingly, is this notion of 10,000 separate buildings. You know, in America, only a few years ago, Ariana Huffington had a great protest uh, movement against SUVs. And there were people out in used car lots with big signs saying, what would Jesus drive? Well, it doesn't matter what he drives, actually, as long as he doesn't drive it to church. Because it's buildings where all of the energy is used in this country. About a quarter of the energy used in America, as you probably know, goes to transportation. Cars, boats, planes, motorcycles, commercial jetliners, the whole thing. Only a quarter. Another quarter goes to manufacturing because most of our manufacturing happens in other countries. We offshored it for just that reason. You know, computers. We don't want to make computers in this country. It's the dirtiest industry ever imagined by humans. It's really funny to me when at the bottom of um, something that comes via email, it says, think twice before printing this out. Hey, you should have thought twice before buying a computer, which is poisoning all of the water in China, where all of the computers are made. We design a few of them here, but um, they're all no matter what brand, manufactured in China because we don't want anything to do with that stuff. Anyway, that's about half the energy used, and the other half is used to heat and cool and light our buildings, like this one. It's not that bad outside right now, although um, we might want to wear a jacket if we were out there, but there's light, and yet here we are, floor walls, roof, ceiling. The only air that we're getting is coming through a machine and, um, and we're burning some nice electric lights and we're talking about sustainability. Great. There's a long way to go for us to be able to change enough that um, we're really going to be a part of um, the ecology of the planet. But we think this um, work at Arcosanti as small as it is, as crude as it is, is nudging reality just a little bit to push us in the direction of real coherence. We hope so. We have one more question. Two more, let's do that. <laughs> so how is current projection of the state of the way southwest throughout, which is different from what they were projecting 40 years ago, how is that? Yeah, current projections for state of the Great Southwest drought. Well, we're in, as I mentioned um, in an earlier panel, we're in the 12th year of a 30-year drought. The most climate scientists imagine that that's what's happening in the American Southwest. And, um, and we really feel it as well. The last time that happened was in the 1400s in um, that area of the world. And at that time, everybody who was living there left moved up to Colorado, up to the mountains, or um, over to uh, the Midwest or someplace where there was some water and um, a little less heat. So Arcosanti is at 3,700 feet in elevation, a little bit temperate on the northern sort of edge, high grassland part of the Sonoran Desert, and we sit on an aquifer. And so at this point, we have three wells on the site. The deepest is 60 feet. Whereas in Phoenix, the average well depth is 1,700 feet because they've mined the groundwater and um, it's getting to be less and less. It, um, we use very little water. We mine um, rainwater such as it is um, for landscape watering. We don't have a car wash and um, we have low flush toilets and, and they're not composting toilets because um, that's a problem for our county supervisors as it is for counties all over the country so far. Um, and otherwise, we're very aware of how much water we use and, um, and try to use as little as possible. But there's growth in central Arizona. You know, when I go back to the East Coast, um, which is actually fairly regularly, there are real adults there who sidle up to me and say, well, what do you think? Is it still possible to buy land in Arizona? Can I afford it? Because um, in Boston, 
or Washington, D.C., or Miami, they're all worried about um, being flooded out in the next generation, and they think it might be a good bet to um, do something in the Southwest. And, and while that's pretty funny, really, um, people worry about that sort of stuff. And so there's continued growth in the state of Arizona. More and more people are moving in, making um, more and more demands on water. And while the Colorado River actually goes through Arizona and borders it on its western edge, California has the water rights to all of that water. And um, there have, in years long time past, been clashes of um, uh, National Guard troops over water rights between those two states, and it's, they're likely to be a few more. But anyway, there is a movement to the north from Tucson and Phoenix, even right now because it's getting so hot there in the summertime. And um, part of that is the plan of um, the Arizona Department of Transportation in which they're doing more interchanges to make more land available for um, populations in central and northern Arizona on the interstate highways. And of course, you maybe heard that the, the big Eisenhower interstate highway um, plan um, has to be completed. And the last little chunk of it is in Arizona that goes from Phoenix up to Las Vegas. And so they're trying to get that funded through the um, U.S. Congress. But so there's tremendous development pressure in and around Arizona and, um, and yet fewer and fewer resources. The town of Prescott, Arizona, which is 30 miles away from us, has um, purchased and pirated water rights from the Chino Valley north of it which is um, watered by the Verde River. This is more detail than you wanted to know, right? <laughs> but the Verde River is this wonderful surface water. You know, there are rivers in Arizona, and um, they're mostly underground. You don't get to, like, water ski on them or anything. And, um, and yet this one is going to be drawn down just as Prescott be continues to sprawl. And so there are issues about how water is used and how what we think is our water on our property is going to be used because, of course, water isn't just there. It flows, and it flows from places, and if people are using it all upstream, then there's less to be used downstream. And as I mentioned, everything is connected, and we're just part of it. So we're trying to be a good neighbor to a whole bunch of people in Arizona and talk to them and others about issues like water and the drought that we're in the middle of and how to live in the desert with that stuff instead of in spite of it, to really be a part of the place where you're growing. Um, so I visited Arcasante about, what was that, two years ago? And uh, really enjoyed getting a chance to see the place and see the experiment in action. And one of the Initial thoughts that came to my mind is the challenge of building a, a community that's really quite isolated. And, um, you know, as you say, there's about 40 people or so living there. Um, you know, it seems that the economic uh, sustenance is largely the tourist um, service that it provides. And I'm curious as you transition in your thinking or, you know, carrying the model logically forward to say, okay, we're looking at a population of thousands of people. How do you imagine that being a, a sustainable economic situation um, given its sort of remote location and the challenge of interfacing with other communities and other forms of trade and that kind of a, a relationship? Um, I'm quite curious from a sustainable economics point of view how you envision that happening. There are a couple ways to deal with that. One of them is the possibility of changing classical economics to take advantage of the externalities both before and after the manufacture of consumer products that current economics doesn't take into account. And so the economics of uh, cities like Phoenix or, um, or Tucson or even Flagstaff don't account for all sorts of um, 
waste that happens that nobody's paying for yet and, um, and the difficulty of mining materials that nobody really pays for to begin with either. And so once more and more people begin to be charged the actual cost of living in um, a Phoenix or um, a Tucson, then the projects like Argosanti, no matter how distant, um, start to become um, pretty interesting looking through an ecological economics, not environmental economics, by the way, which is another way of monetizing other pieces of the living biosphere. But otherwise, it's, um, it's not that distant from anybody. It's about an hour from Phoenix, an hour from Flagstaff, half an hour from Prescott. There um, is a private airport nearby. There are ways to um, get to it, certainly. There are ways that we are saving water through the development of solar greenhouses right now to grow food. And in fact, as a result of that, we're beginning to be a food resource for the region. Otherwise, you know, it's the Sonoran Desert and we get our food same place you do from Southern California or from Mexico or Chile or uh, someplace else. And um, so agriculture, greenhouse agriculture, urban greenhouse agriculture is a part of it. And, um, and the notion of being part of that particular landscape and bringing businesses to it, you know, it used to be if you didn't live in New York in America, then you didn't live in New York. And that was too bad because that's where everything was happening. But now you can do pretty much any job you can think of anywhere you want, distant, remotely, via computer. And, um, and so we have people at Arcosani now who are consultants to companies elsewhere and are there because they want to be. Ultimately, sustainability doesn't depend on efficiency, I would say, or um, energy production, but it depends on lovability. Lovable places are places that humans are going to sustain and that um, sustain people as well. And Arcosani so far is one of those places. The fact that it has been built by people who haven't made a dime off of uh, building it so far has been pretty interesting. And the fact that they've been workshop participants, there have been 7,000 of them. 7,000 people since 1970 have participated in the construction of that place. And um, I knew a whole bunch of them. I, I know who built my apartment, who um, did the plumbing on it, and, um, and who placed that skylight in the, the cafe above uh, part of a more complex and interesting building that we didn't actually look at much at Argosani. And so there's that connection to um, people who built it, and those people are continuing to be interested in the place and many of them are getting to be retirement age, too. And so there's a way that they might start their second careers at Arcosanti as citizens of that place. By the way, this is something you're going to have to deal with, too. Not only are there going to be plenty of natural disasters for you to deal with, but your parents' generation, the largest generation in the history of the planet, are going to retire, and they're not going to be able to drive their car to the grocery store anymore. So there's some architecture that needs work. Really, there's plenty of work for you to do, and I'm glad to see you at this conference and part of the University of Oregon getting trained to do it. Good. Thank you. Take a break. <laughs>